Check one, check two. Can you hear me now? I don't think I had a Yeti mic on. We need to call Kev Tech. To do <laughs> facts, facts. Can you hear me now? Uh, my father, I had the Yeti mic off. I, I do need Kev Tech. Shout out to Kev Tech. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm old, man. I need help from everybody. <laughs> Shout out to, to chat for uh, staying in there with me. So let, let's get into it. Yeah, Kev Tech's my guy, man. He always sends a few people to talk to me about uh, security. So anybody Kev Tech sends to me, I'm going to take care of him. Yeah. Oh, people need help too, Trash Can Wave. <laughs> Shout out to Trash Can Wave. Um, but let's get at it. We're just going to go over a couple videos I did while people were flying, <laughs> while people file in. Uh, miter CV exposes. Yeah, that's kind of embarrassing, man. I, I didn't have a mic on. <laughs> I got a new Yeti mic. Um, I left one of my current clients that I was at for nine years. They got me a Yeti mic and a PBO um, big sign, you know, like with lights on it. So I'm gonna put that up behind me. So <laughs> I'm trying to get my little uh, studio. Shout out to Trash Can. He he got a uh, great studio setup. I need to get my game up there. I need to get my game up there. But once again, MITRE, they take care of these uh, vulnerabilities and exposures when people report to them. I don't think a lot of people realize when people find a vulnerability, when they report it to MITRE, MITRE might not put it up for two months to give the company time enough to patch their vulnerabilities. You don't want to say it's a vulnerability. You know, all the bad guys go out there and look at them, right? So when they expose that vulnerability, you know, they're... Uh, I, I think they're going to get sued, by the way. But go check that video out. So um, I'm always talking about hospitals. U.S. government warrants hospital cyber attacks. Uh, if you look at CISA, they actually have specific checks for hospitals because their security is so lax. Um, somebody comment on that video. I think your super large hospitals are okay, but your mid-sized to small smaller hospitals, they're they're struggling. They're super struggling. So um, I think that's why people uh, attack them. And two is if you lock up their systems, people could die. So they're more apt to pay in Bitcoin or ransomware, right? So I think that's why a lot of people hit uh, hospitals, low-hanging fruit. My setup is that of a 12-year-old child. <laughs> it's minor a double-edged source since it can serve as a database for hackers. Oh, facts, JM, facts. You know, that's it. That is true. Um, I always tell people at work, you, I always call, that's the honeypot, even though that's not the <laughs> correct term for honeypot. Yeah, if, if they get those um, vulnerabilities and, you know, people get in there and find them before, you know, the company can get them past JM, that's definitely a... Uh, um a double s sword i call it the um a honey pot i couldn't remember if you or him had asked me to do the application uh, security jam i couldn't remember if it was you you were a helmet so that's what we're gonna do it today a lot of times my subscribers ask me to do something you know i try to knock it on that especially if it's in the um bandwidth of what i usually do so uh apple blocks nation hackers apple's put some um Shout out to Apple, man. I think they're one of the top security firms. They put a couple things in the block uh, Pegasus, the Israel uh, hacking group in their phone. But of course, you got to disable a, a few things you might need, right? But for, for but if you are a president or a whatever, governor or some high level ranking official, you wouldn't mind cutting those 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 features off, right? So uh, shout out to Apple. They, they're on top of their game, right? Somebody said, put it out. They put the block, but we know it's a cat and mice game, right? So they're going to block it, then somebody else is going to find something to get around it. But I think once you do is they keep raising the bar, so they done knocked out the script kitties, knocked out the regular guys, knocking out mostly those mafia bad guys. So now I think to really attack Apple, you got to be, you know, top 10%, top 20% on, on the red team side to really uh, – Get, get access to Apple phone, right? And this one I put out this morning, rest in peace. Uh, Tesla had a fatal accident. You can see it right there. Um, they don't know if the uh, autopilot was on or the autonomous driving on was on. I think it would have to be on for you to, or maybe they fell asleep though. That's just a weird thing. I think the autonomous was on. So they're looking at the uh, the accident, right, for Tesla. And, you know, they're going to report on it and tell you if the, um, autopilot was on right so but rest in peace but shout out to tesla they always make the cars better i always you know adding features to it so 
um, this type of accident won't happen next time, right? Like we were talking about with the hackers, they keep getting better and better with their um, auto driving and auto piling. And there's so many companies trying to get into that realm also, right? So we know everybody's into it. So um, I think autonomous trucks are going to be driving. They're driving now. I think they're going to be really in full effect in probably 2024, 2025, where they're going to do, they call it the second part. With a trucker, you're going to drive it up on a highway, then the autopilot is going to take it from one end of the country to the other, and then the driver is going to take it to the city, unload it, and park it, right? But that's going to be like 80% of the money because that's going to be 80% of the trip, right? And we're short on um, truck drivers, right? So I don't think they're going to be vastly unemployed or some or vastly disappear, right? So I just think it's a step on that evolution, right? So. Once again, if you got any questions, put them in the chat. We, we can get to them. Thanks. I had a little mic difficulty. I forgot to cut the Yeti on. <laughs> Shout out to me. Oh, let's go and get to it. Let's go and bring it on up. So we're going to talk about application security. We're going to touch on a few, few things. Um, part of my current job. <laughs> Is it up to? Uh, to so let's see. Uh, part of my current job is I work with developers. I'm a security engineer, compliance, federal. I do a little bit of everything. But one of my main jobs is I sit with our application team, my development team, and give them security checks and go through them and make sure uh, they're locked down. Uh, one we're going to talk about is the OWASP top 10. Then we're going to talk about the STIGs, right? And we're going to actually go through each one of OWASP top 10 pretty quick and see what those checks are, right? Then in there, too, we're going to talk a little bit about threat modeling, modeling your application to say, if these three, if these threats happen, what what would you do, right? How are we blocking them? And if we can't block them, what is our uh, disaster recovery plan or how do we recover if this particular thing happens, right? If ransomware happens, I mean, what's going to happen, right? Cross-site scripting happens, what happens, right? Somebody steal the database, what, what, what happens, right? So... We're going to talk about application security. Um, of course, I love AWS. We're going to look at a couple of their features. We actually went on the past, but we show how we would use them in application security, right? Once again, you got any questions, throw them in the box. So what is application security? It's a process of making apps more secure by finding, fixing, and enhancing the security of your applications. Much of this happens during the, the development phase. That is incorrect, <laughs> but includes tools, methods to protect apps once they are deployed. This is becoming more important as hackers are increasingly targeting applications uh, with their attacks. Especially when you have a web app, it's open to the whole world, right? AD 443, right? So it's easy to attack, right? It's, it's out there, it's open to the world, right? The reason I said development phases. And I did a little work in Silicon Valley, and I'm helping a couple of small startups. They start with features because features is what make the money. They don't worry about security and start until they start making money or until somebody asks them about security. Right. So, one of my uh, small guy I'm cool with, young young guy, he's starting a company. I don't want to tell what it is, uh, even though I did sign because I, I signed an NDA, but he's cool. I'm gonna have him on the show. But we start talking about security, right? But Features is what sells stuff. Like I said, people don't talk about security. He's trying to do a um, applications that he's going to sell to the government, right? So since he's selling to the government, the government asked for security requirements and security plans and security features and policies and procedures, right, to help that. But most companies I work for is after the fact. Somebody, they're selling to a big company like a hospital. Now they need, you know, these policies and procedures and a security program. So that's when people start asking about it. Are wars created and applied? Are wars created and applied by the developer or their responsibility of the administrator or the user? You talk about a war zip file, like you zip your call out, then you deploy it into production or development, JL. Uh, let me know that. I think I think that's the word you're talking about. Just give me a yes or no. Is that the when you zip up the code and you got to deploy it into production or into development uh, with the code of actually the product they're trying to use? Or develop jam so um this is 
best practices for cloud encryption management. So what security in the cloud is part of application security, right? So I just want to push this up there. We're really talking about the application, which is going to be on-prem or in the cloud. 90% of the people, especially if it's new, they're going to put it in the cloud. Web application. For, oh, okay. Uh, I'm at, that's actually coming up in the course. So uh, hold tight, JM. That's coming your way. We're going to talk about that's coming up in about four slides. We're going to talk about the uh, the WAF of the uh, AWS and what that pre prevents and uh, some things we need to use that for. So that's coming up in a second. Uh, assess the security requirement of the cloud. Study the finer details. Back up your cloud data locally. Cloud cryptography, which is encryption. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Cloud access brokers, uh, retain and complete visibility into there, right? So when you take your application and put it in the cloud, right, you have application security, but I think you need to add cloud security, right? Because on-prem, you know, it's mostly internally with your web. And in your cloud, most of the time it's APIs. You actually even call in AWS services. You call in other services that you connect with or integrate with, right? So that's an extra security you have to do in the cloud. What's up, Helmet? Salute. <clears throat> so there's kind of, there's way more than three teams <laughs> when we talk about security. It's, I think it's six, but we're going to talk about the big three when you talk about teams of security. Red team, ethical hacking, penetration, black box testing, social engineering. Shout out to uh, Alpha Cybers in there, Gabe A, right? Those two guys I reach out when we're talking about red team offensive guys that are on top of their game right so i tell those guys when i get my little lab set up we're gonna walk through uh there it is blue team red team right if they talk about attacking i'm not talking about defending right so blue team defensive infrastructure security damage control incident response operational security threat hunting and digital forensics right the crazy thing is, I always thought digital forensic was in the red team. So you learn something every day. But no, so those are the blue team's defensive, red team offense. The purple team is the collaboration of that in the middle. Purple team usually files under application security, where you take all those things and you meld them together, right? Purple team, data collection and implementation team, improved facility, uh, improvement of facilitation, data analytics, gap analysis. Red versus uh, blue team skill testing, system improvement, and collabor collaborative security, right? Because you got to do really both of them, right, when you're talking about application security because uh, you're going to get offensive attacks, right? So you got to know those offensive attacks to be able to block them. So we're going to get to JM. We're going to talk about the uh, AWS web application firewall. We're going to talk about OWASP top 10, how AWS WAF blocks the OWASP top 10, and some other things it does, right? So we got the red team offensive, blue team defensive, and uh, purple team application security, mail and buffer those team together. What's up, Sneaky Junkie? Glad you can make it. You're welcome, man. So, um, oh, so this is what Helmet was asking. So here is AWS application firewall. Your client usually is your customer. They're coming in from the internet. Right, or even if they could be on prem, right? You can have a web application that never is open to the internet. It's just used internally, right? But we always start with it's on the internet, right? So your web application security, we look at the rate limited and your OWASP top 10, uh, your Amazon gateway, your secret manager, and there's a bad actor, right? He went around your, your WAF, right? So WAF is a web application firewall, right? So that's one of the things we're going to talk about that's going to help us with the OWASP top 10. So the cool thing is with AWS, they have so many features that can assist you. You just need to be aware of those features and 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 and, and how to uh, configure them, use them. And, you know, a lot of times you just pay for them, right? So what is the OWASP top 10? Shout out to engineering time. I like to, I like purple team. No one delves in the purple team. Yeah, that is kind of a lost art. I only know one lady who actually, uh, really focus her whole youtube on purple team she actually has a course that's pretty good i actually won the course and I, i've been so busy i haven't taken it yet but the purple team is application security right um so you gotta be familiar with the programming language connections database web services um how they're integrated with other services right so that's a myriad of skills so 
So OWASP top 10 is the top 10 security vulnerabilities that they did a um, survey for that uh, OWASP uh, reports on every year. So um, in 2021, it was broken access con control, cryptography, cryptographic failures, injection, insecure design, misconfiguration, vulnerable and outdated components, identification and authentication failures, software uh, data integrity failures, security logging and monitoring, and server-side request forgery. So you can see um, <laughs> from 2017, uh, there's only three new ones and the seven <laughs> were the same. If you go back five years from that, it's probably six of them are the same, right? <laughs> we don't do a good job about fixing these uh, security features over the years, right? So you got to think, what's that, uh, three, four years ago? And to, to, six of them are still in the top. So we got to do a better job at cybersecurity. So so let's hit it real quick. We're going to delve on it, but let's hit them. Bro, access control uh, moves up to fifth. Contributed data indicates application tested are more common weaknesses. Uh, 34 CVs mapped to broken access control and have more occurrences application than any other category. So access control is then explained well as you could give network access, uh, user access, <laughs> and, and uh, roles and responsibility access. Most of the time it's broken, right? A lot of people do <laughs> um, MFA and they don't do it right. So that means people can actually steal your MFA token using an attacker, right? So you're not using your access control. Or you saying you can only use these AWS services, but like we saw on the <laughs> WAF, I could go around that and use any other services, right? So we're not con controlling the access control of what we can get to, right, as a company or even as a user. Cryptographic failures, which is a broad symptom of root cause. Renewed name failures related to cryptography has been uh, implicitly before. The category leads to sensitive data exposure or system compromise. So when you use encryption or you use improper encryption, right? We talk about AES-256, but if you download it from somebody on the internet, did they program that encryption correctly? Shout out to Engineering Cannabis. He studies encryption. That encryption is hard to do, right? You talk about 16 rounds encryption, a, 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 a phrase seed into a, um, a predicate number. You take the number three or 400 times to come up with a long crypt encryption key that can't be broke, right? And if you look through the encryption, there's probably 100 encryption. 95% of them have been broke, right? So are you using a proper encryption and has that encryption been validated, right? That it's being um, used properly with that particular product. Injection uh, slides down the third. Uh, applications were tested for a form of injection, and uh, 33 were mapped to that category. Cross site script is now part of the category in this uh, edition, right? So when they talk about injection, you got SQL injection, uh, command injection, or cross site scripting, meaning I can inject some code into your software and query stuff that I shouldn't be able to query, right? A lot of times people don't validate their their, co their columns or their data. So I could put a select something, you save it in there, then I can query that data out your database, right? Because you didn't validate it, right? So I can inject malware code or even SQL statements in there to pull additional information out of your, your database, right? So insecure design <laughs> if we really want to move left as industry we need to more threat modeling we're going to show threat modeling coming up at a, at a high level secure design patterns principle and reference architecture and insecure design cannot be fixed by a perfect implementation right so if you design it broke it's going to be broke right the cool thing i like about aws is they had a ton what they said security patterns reference architecture and design principles right so you can go out there and pull those down and when you use them right you're 80 percent of the way there threat modeling is what we're going to do is we're going to go through the app and say in these places what are the threats that 
uh, could get our application or hack, hack our application. The crazy thing is somebody reached out to me for a job and it was for threat modeling. He said he couldn't find anybody that even knew what threat modeling was. Um, we're going to talk about it. And I, we're going to talk about the Stigs. I'm a Stig guy. Part of Stigs is you got to do a threat model. Right. And once again, we're going to walk through a threat modeling. But it was for Cap Gemini. Uh, it was a decent job. I think it was 90. Uh, but they couldn't find anybody that could do secure design and threat modeling and test it, right, for that. So, and and what we're talking about, uh, DevSecOps, that files under there. Um, the security of the app, we got to do threat modeling, right, and figure out what attacks can occur. <laughs> and two, the other part of that is the response. If that attacks occur and is successful, what is our response to that, right? All that's part of threat modeling. Uh, secure misconfiguration. 90% of the applications were tested from, for some form of misconfigurations with the average incident rate of 4.5 and over 2,008 occurrences of the map risk. Uh, more shifts, highly configurable software. It's not surprising to see this category move up. Uh, 2017 was called that. Application gets more complicated, it gets harder to do. So to configure it right, of course, is gonna make it harder to do. I think the um, the other good part of that is a lot of people now, you go on AWS and Azure, you can just spin up full applications that are already pre-configured for you, right? So hopefully that, uh, I'm rounding it up, that 5% of misconfigurations hopefully will drop, right? So if you misconfigure and it's, <laughs> with your passwords or something right now, you leaking that information out for the, uh, a lot of people were putting stuff on a, um, AWS and they were leaving their database open up to the internet, right? That's misconfiguration, right? And it was costly. Isn't the protocol, isn't it the protocol you attack when you break cryptography? Uh, yep, you can break the protocol. There's a couple ways to do it. Uh, Caleb, you can break the protocol. Sometimes they just don't, encrypted right right so i can download the <laughs> encrypted information and i can just uh brute force it and break it right um because nine times out of ten they're going to be using a, some form of aes or des3 and uh a lot half the time though is they put the key with the code so if i break into the web server i can actually get the encryption key because they keep it next to the data which is another form of misconfiguration when uh when I go out and work with smaller companies, that's what I see a lot of times. Uh, Caleb, vulnerable and outdated components, uh, CVE, way to file. So that's a lot of times when I make a lot of people upset. Is I tell them, you need to have, you need to uh, you need to buy the product so you can get security support. Right, a lot of open source you get security when they give it to you right so one of the checks is when we talk about stickers you got to buy support because when support comes they owe you security checks and enhancements to get that right so a lot of times when you use open source which I, which i'm not a get against you need to make sure they're on top of those security patches and feature patches and they're getting that turnaround quicker right when you pay people right you can usually <laughs> get them to do stuff a little quicker right so that's why we say you got to have paid support. And that's actually one of the checks. And um, actually, no, watch top 10. That's the check for that, that you need to have paid support. Identification and authentication broke. Uh, failures. Uh, this category is still a turn on part of top 10, but increased availability of standardized framework seems to be helping. Right. Once again, most people don't set up their identification and authentication authentication correctly are you using right passwords are you using long passwords are you using mfa are you doing one-way hash so when i steal your password files if it's a one-way hash i can't read it right especially if you put a sod on it meaning you add, you're adding extra characters to somebody's password so when they encrypt it right in the password files it's bigger and looks strenuous right so that's how you handle the identification authorization Software and data integrity. Uh, we talked about this a little uh, last week, focusing on making assumptions related to software updates, critical data, CI, uh, CD pipelines without verifying integrity. So when people put up code and your developers push it out, are you validating that they put it out there? Because if you look at Kaseas, they believe Rush should add extra code in there so they could 
take over that application when it got into government uh, facilities installation, right? So are you doing integrity and security on your continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline of your code if you're developing code as a company, right? That's part of DevSecOps. We got to make sure that pipeline. Insufficient logging and monitoring. Uh, this category expanded to include more types of failures, challenging for tests, isn't well represented in the CVEs. However, failures in this category can directly impact visibility, incident alert, alerting, and forensics, right? So if you get hacked, how do you know what they stole, when they stole it, and how big they stole it? And if you don't know what they stole and where they stole it, you can't do a forensic check on it, right? So let me move my head and see that forensics check real quick. Forensics, right? So, and we talked about that. So, if you know these, if you can look in your logs and say these four EC2s were hit, right? Then I know I need to take those uh, forensics, take those EC2s, dump the memory, dump the open files, uh, take it off the network, put a security group around so nobody can see it, right? And it can't spread anything else, right? But how would I know that if I don't have logging so I can get forensics ready, you know, to be able to check that? Shout out to Peter uh, and Peter Investor M. Glad you can join us. Us uh, server side request request forgery. The data shows relatively low. This category represents a scenario where the security community members are telling us that this is important, even though it's not illustrated in the data at the time, right? So I think the reason why it doesn't come up as people think is important is I think a lot of bad guys are using it. And a lot of people are are not familiar with checking that or being able to track that down in the log. So I think that's why the community came out and said they see that a lot when they were actually um, interviewing hackers and bad guys and even uh, red team guys that were, you know, doing work to uh, find vulnerabilities in those systems. Right? So uh, application security, talking about the OWASP top 10, we just went through them. So you can do while you're developing it, while you building it in development, you can use Amazon's Code Guru. It's going to go through your code, review your code, right? Shout out to Engineering Cannabis. It's going to use machine learning. We've got the ML up there. Uh, Amazon Code Review going to use machine learning and code reviews and optimize high, optimize high performing applications. You can do that while you're building. It's with your IDE or when you check it into um, AWS Code Commit. We can run that on your check in to figure out. Do you have OWASP top 10 issues inside your code, right? Want to get that early? Want to get that working? Uh, using SIM can help sort, organize, and find. Oh, no, facts, JM. <laughs> SIM is what you need. Is, is uh, The only problem with SIM is they are very expensive, <laughs> even the cheap ones. Um, we're going to talk about later on is uh, AWS has theirs. It's, it's super inexpensive, but to configure it, right? Because when you're talking about a SIM, right? I got to go through everything. I got to get logs from my database, my web server, my app server, uh, my BPC logs uh, coming from my uh, networking of AWS. So you got to get all that stuff in one place and you got to get it harmonized so all the logs make sense. So you can query what's happened on an app application server, a VPC and a database, and the logs are lined up so you can trace that transaction through your company through your VPC, through your networking. You can even trace it from your on-prem to AWS and back from AWS to your on-prem, but you got to have all that stuff. We use, I hate this word, we use the, all your logs needs to be harmonized, right? And when you look at your logs, they all look different. Your web server looks different than your app server, your database, your VPC logs even inside uh, AWS looks different. So whatever SIM you need needs to understand each one of those products or services and make sure they can harmonize those laws to make sure you can trace that transaction coming from the outside inside and even to on-prem you know if you're hooking up aws to your on-prem right through a through a vpn tunnel but so we can use amazon code uh code guru we're going to get that inside our uh ide while we're developing it we can get that and when we're checking in the code commit right we can uh get that in the, and also part of code guru is profiler detect and optimize the expensive lines of your code pre-production right if you got a bad sql statement or it thinks you're going through 
four or five jumps into your network and you really should only be doing one hop that code profiler will help you optimize your your aws infrastructure right usually you needed about two or three consultants and pay them an astronaut amount of money to figure that out for you right so that's why you got the code guru for the reviewer and you got the code profile also you're going to easily identify performance and cost improvements in your production environment and once again uh get the best use of aws and hopefully the best security why, why are you doing it too right so once again that was aws top 10. my favorite dld stigs i do a lot of federal work um so when i give this to my application teams they don't like me because there are 286 developer checks <laughs> the developer team needs to do to get an ato authority to operate if you're doing some application development for the government right so i'm a stig guy shout out to gabe i'm sure he's gonna pop up he doesn't like the stigs but uh, i like it because it's a comprehensive check right and we're just gonna go through a cop a couple of them but um these are the things hopefully where you won't end up on the OWASP top 10 or hopefully it'll stop you from getting hacked, right? But once again, these are development checks that your development team needs to be going through, right? And you as a security person, which I do, I sit down with them, I go through them because some of them we can do and some of them we can't do, right? If we can't do that, what's the mitigated control? Can we accept the risk, right? So there's a couple of things, you know, we got to talk about. So I'm gonna leave that up and put that above my head. Let's see what's in there. Yeah, shout out to the sim, and we're gonna go over uh, AWS's sim in the future. That's on my thing. Um, on one on my list as part of DevSecOps. Is the open source security onion normally used in real world as a sim, or do companies normally opt to get their sim that they have to pay for? I've never seen a company. <laughs> I've, I've never seen a large company use security onion. Right? Um, security onion is good, but when you talk about a large company um, with 400 or even a thousand VMs, they're generating a petabyte. I don't think the security onion can have that. So you're talking about Splunk, which is a crazy amount of money. Uh, Kibana, uh, Elk Stack. Those are the things I see in production. IBM has one that's pretty uh, pretty cool. Uh, I use Oracle's Audit Vault a couple of times on, on a client. So I've never seen security onion used but you gotta remember jm i live in that fed government space man that's why i'm chunky man i'd be i'd be eating on that federal money uh jm but i've never seen security onion used in a, a state or federal client that i've used that i've worked with and i probably worked with 30 40 <laughs> bigger bigger clients though bigger clients though so real quick the the stig stands for security technical implementation guidelines it's published as a tool to improve security for the department of defense the requirements are the, uh, derived by uh, national institute of standards and technologies NIST 800-53 so that's kind of what i live with and i argue with a lot of because they're like why should we do the stigs i'm like dude it's they're just hardening checks. They're nothing different. There's no difference than doing the CIS checks or the HIPAA checks or the PSCI checks. I just think it's thorough. It's bigger and better and more thorough, right? But once again, I, I live in that federal space, so uh, I'm about that pain. <laughs> I'm about that pain and that life. I always joke with people. I'm about this security life. Uh, don't steal that. I'm, I'm gonna get some merchandise and put that on some merchandise. <laughs> but let's look at a couple of the checks. Uh, yeah, it's big enough let me know if y'all can see it i think it's big enough so um so i did the high level they're usually high medium and low there's a few highs a whole bunch of mediums you saw in there let's go back real quick it's like a bell curve 31 highs 22 lows and 233 mediums the cool thing about mediums is you can get compensating controls you can accept the risk there's some things you can do cat ones you gotta fix as is right that means they're highly vulnerable and they're being attacked in a while and hackers are taking them taking those uh cat ones out as we speak so we got to fix those so i think i just picked out three so give you vulnerability id it's high so the application must enforce a limit of three consecutive invalid logon attempts by a user during a 15 minute period uh, by limiting numbers of failed logon attempts the risk of an unauthorized system access fee user password guessing otherwise known as brute force is reduced right so 
um, I sit down with the development teams and we just go through each one of these and we just say, good, not good. If we're not good, how are we going to fix it? And a poem is basically a schedule. If we're, if we're not fixing it today, when can we have it fixed? Because uh, we're going to get out of it. Like I said, I do federal work. So we're going to get out of it by health and hospital, FISMA, DOD, FERPA, few education. So when you come in, if you have these questions already answered, you can give them to the auditor and the auditor could auditor can see you as a security program is on top of it right so oh, i think i skipped one let me read jm's i mean that's peter investor what he got so the vulnerabilities of the system or app can come from source code lack of improper maintenance which is more vulnerable um let's say vulnerabilities I can come from the source code, lack of, or improper maintenance. Source code probably would be the most vulnerable. That means it was started in the beginning, right? Lack of or improper maintenance, right? <laughs> um, hopefully it was super secure, and hopefully if you're, for some reason, you can't patch it or they're not keeping it up, right? But we know uh, security vulnerabilities and hackers get better, right? That one thing that came out for Apache Live for Jay, that, that's been in there forever and it, it just came out like oh this is security that that vulnerability probably apache live for j probably was in there for a decade before somebody found it right so um but once again i think source code is because at, at worst cases if i can get my hand on a source code me and us me and a team of dudes that are if we understand that language we can patch it ourselves right a lot of times we tell auditors if we take source code and it's open source and we really need it and we really use it either we buy support or we're going to take on that responsibility ourselves into manually patching stuff which is a bear i wouldn't recommend it but i rolled my sleeve up on a couple projects in dod and we made some changes and did some patches on the fly because you know they had to be done you know so but no i would say source code jane another high one let me take this off uh, when we talked about that as part of OWASP top 10, all those really are in uh, this is sticks with those whatever 250 plus checks are in there. So this is one of the uh, OWASP top 10, the injection one. The application must not be vulnerable to SQL injection. SQL injection is uh, a code injection attack against database application. Malicious SQL statements are inserted in an application data entry field where they're submitted to the database and executed. This direct result of non-validated input that is used by the application to perform a command or execution, right? Meaning you could pull more stuff out. Uh, two is how do we fix it? Modify the application and uh, remove SQL injection. And over here is kind of like the executive summary. Review the application documentation and interview the application administrator. Request the latest vulnerability scan of test results, right? So. Us as a company, we got to be scanning for SQL ejection. We just looked at AWS code review that would fall under to a, un, file under that, right? It was doing our vulnerability scan as part of that. And two is we used WAF at the top that was blocking SQL injection, right? It blocked the old OWASP top 10. So we got AWS WAF uh, blocking OWASP top 10, especially the injection part. We got the code guru up there right here it says we got to uh, show our latest vulnerability scan all right so that's one reason i tell people to read the stigs and people get very upset is you learn a lot when you read them because it tells you explicitly what you need to do and explicitly how you need to fix and let me get my head away they actually talking about uh It's small, but if you look at the last um, third line from the top, if the results, uh, if the scan results are not, avail not available, identify the database products in use and refer to the OWASP uh, top 10 application testing guide to detail instruction on performing a manual SQL injection test. Right. So they're actually referencing the OWASP. If you want to look, I put the OWASP and um, uh, we're going to look at it. It's called. Um, uh, injection monkey it shows you how to do SQL injection all injection inside the cloud it's actually a product we're going to use um, that could test oh what's top 10 in your application inside the cloud so we're going to get to that I put those two links in the bottom of the description 
I'm sure I'll be adding more. Now with that, uh, application must not be subject to input handling uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, some examples of that: form data, hidden fields, cookies, HTTP headers, client data. So when people, when you're putting data in the uh, websites and even on site, especially website, they need to be validating that data before it gets to the back end, before it gets to the database. You should be scanning files you're uploading before they actually hit your EC2 inside your VPC in AWS. Because if you get malware and ransomware back there, they're just going to run them up, right? So you need to be scanning all that stuff before you actually get it into your app or get it into your uh, your AWS VPC. One of the tools you can download at a free is OpenSCAP, an open source this certified compliance tool used uh, to automate uh, content um, automation protocols, to automate continuous monitoring and vulnerability management scan, reporting on security policy compliance data. Although OpenSCAP is geared towards DOD, security can be applied to set of security baselines for any industry, right? So once again, I like to use uh, big boy security even when I'm working in in commercial America, right? Because the, the same nation states that are hitting DOD and big time government, they're hitting regular companies and they're, and they're taking them out the box because they don't have high level security. So the other thing too is AWS system managers, you can do run command and then it can actually look at your EC2s, your S3, and it actually takes those stick checks we looked at you can actually have a system manager run them across your whole uh, AWS enterprise and infrastructure. You get those checks ran that way, right? Um, so there's AWS gives you a myriad of cornucopia of services to do those security checks, right? So I just want to touch on each one of those. And of course, I keep saying this every time, we're going to lab in the future and show them, <laughs> I promise, right? So, and when we do those scans with the uh, system manager, just what it actually looks like. Uh, you actually see it tells you if it was a medium check it tells you if it's new it tells you if that if that was active uh it tells you let me get my big out of the way again if it was FIPS, which is an encryption uh those last two are encryption and the other one is a uh, privilege uh separation escal escalation so it shows you from those sticks which one and when you scan it gives you a nice report once again we can lay this out for your developers, the other thing too is, I work with the CISO and the uh, CIO. When security asks the development team to do all the security work, there's a cost for that. So I need this uh, report to show, then I can give it to, which I've done, and I'm interviewing my show, the head of programming because I need to know how much time and how much money these checks are gonna cost. Cause I gotta go to the CISO and the CIO to ask for money right money's not infinite so if i got 400 checks that could be 80 hours at 150 dollars an hour if we got consultants right security's not cheap and money's not infinite right so we need this type of uh stuff because we to fix it it's gonna cost money right the two is you're getting a budget you're getting and the other part of that is this is gonna show you your risk of where your company's at right that's why i tell people and we're gonna do this i'm coming up promise uh in August, I got some labs. So we're going to lab where we're going to scan this. And this right here, it's going to show you vulnerabilities, but it's going to show you the risk of your organization, where you at as a company, right? If you got 50 <laughs> highs and 300 cat twos, you're not in a very, uh, sec you're not in a very great security posture as a company, right? So these reports show you the risk of your company, where you at, right? If you got all lows, you cool. If you got all highs and they're being attacked and they're over 40 uh, EC2 VMs, right? <laughs> You're in bad shape. So this also shows you the risk of where your company's at. That's one reason I like running the STIGs, right? But I'm old. But you can run CIS, STIGs, uh, PCI. You know, they, they're going to show you where you at as a company, right? So threat modeling, all right? I, <laughs> I've had a couple people reach out to me. So what is threat modeling? Threat modeling works to... I, Identify, communicate, and understand threats and mitigation within the context of protecting something of value, right? So when we talk about our web app, what are we trying to protect with that? What, what are we doing with that? What, what's, what, what are we maximizing that, right? How are we making that happen, right? Threat models is a structure representation of all the information that's 
affect the security of application and exit it's a view of the application and its and its environments through the lens of security threat modeling can be applied to a wide range of things including software application systems networking distributed systems internet of thing devices and business processes right so it's just not code right it's like you said it's the network that your <laughs> code sits on your code's usually running a web server app server Apache, c sharp java tomcat iis uh there's so many web servers out there right but we need to do a threat modeling and figure out what does that actually look like threat modeling typically includes the description of the subject to be modeled the assumption that it can be checked or challenged in the future as the threat landscape changes potential threats to the system actions that can be taken to mitigate each threat a way of validating the model and threats and verification uh success of the action taking right so if we got a threat modeling we figured out the threat did we close the threat did we accept the threat did we do a mitigating control to do something else beside the threat right so uh threat mine is a process of capturing organizing analyzing this information applied to the software uh so here's let me move that to the side of one all right and we'll walk through it let me know if i need to make that bigger that doesn't look too bad so at the top we got our external user we got our web application up there we got uh spoof tampering spoof tampering and part of that i would put um ddos up there right so that's a threat right how do we what's up brother mitch what do we do to 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 take care of that firewall right firewall bypass three is routing table poisoning uh ddos right so there we will have our WAF, right uh number four is spoofing and tempering uh ddos attack or privilege privilege escalation right then you got uh firewall by bypass routing of tables right phishing emails in the back uh tempering information disclosure man in the middle attack is eight right so each one of those reds boxes in this is a potential attack to our infrastructure at that location right? even though um i like how they did the first part is what the internet the dmz is usually what's open to the internet and what's your backend application can can touch right then back there is the corporate network all right so that's our standard three-tier network all right so we talked about that so each one of those attack comes at a different level and we've been talking about them right we got WAF, we got guard duty we got detective aws detective aws has a ton of web services right once we get to our application server hopefully we did those 300 checks right and our application is locked down database right we talked about that two video goes encryption at rest encryption at trends and encryption in memory right so where each one of those red boxes are we're going to walk through how do we protect it how do we block it then <laughs> and uh incident response if that doesn't work what is what is our next procedure right and through is we talked about in, in there we got run books right i did a run book where if somebody's secret keys got took from aws what should you do right you should delete the keys delete the keys that that are on all those es e, e, ec2 boxes right where the, could those keys get to the database right then each one of those keys we can look through the logs and look for certain ips to see if they try to hack into some with those keys those keys got them to another AWS services, right? But you need this with your run book to say, okay, I thought about these things ahead of time. So if they're so if they're hacking, so if they happen, I'm not struggling to catch up or I got a run book and I got these policies and procedures. So if I, if I got uh, somebody bypass my firewall or I got a DDoS or I got a poison routing table, what should I do? Is being exposed to the internet of oh yeah that's number one up here <laughs> yeah that is but that's how you make money right so that's part of doing business right so so I, I always link those two is okay if I need to be exposed to the internet that's a vulnerability 
what do I need to, to lock down to help me not get act right? Why firewall? Like you say, oh, watch top 10. Uh, uh, virus protection, malware protection, right? All that front end, zero trust, right, Peter? So now we got to put all that into effect, right? But now that actually is the number one vulnerability. So one of the first things that when, when I come to a shop is, and I ask them, most people put everything <laughs> open to the internet. So I ask them, is that a internal service or is that an external service? A lot of times it's they got a lot of stuff that it makes it easier for their employees to go through because it's on the internet. But if it doesn't need to be on the internet, I'm like, let's bring it internal, take it off the internet. Then we got to, you know, get our Cisco guys to make sure those routes now are, are accessible inside our internal network, right? You might have to actually VPN to a different subnet to get to it, right? So it makes it a little harder sometimes. Uh, Peter, but that's an excellent question. An excellent question is if it doesn't need to be on the internet, then I will bring it off of the internet, right? Then once again, right, you got to start working because uh, your network guys might gotta make sure all the routes are available. It could be um, I worked at a Fortune 500 company. They had 20 different um, satellite companies in different countries around the world, right? So now you're trying to figure out how do you get all that networking to work. Right, Peter, which is a little harder. Where if I got it on the internet, I can just go to the internet and get to. But now, since it's not on the internet, I got to get my internal routing set up, right? And I got to get all that configured, get that configured and working. Shout out to Network, bruh, my Cisco guy. Forensic computer to the internet. Oh, facts. You. you <laughs> that's why it's good practice not to connect forensic computer to the internet. You should not have your forensic computer connected to the internet internet no way shape or form even with the software that's on your forensic team you need to get those updates put them on a usb drive then okay that usb drive for when you're updating the software put it in update your software right then take it off they take that usb connection off and disable it so um i get a lot of flack for that <laughs> jl people don't like me but uh no i tell a lot of we call them air gap computers. You cannot even hook it to the internet for software updates. Now, AWS is kind of cool. Okay, I can actually have that forensic computer in a private subnet. I can actually route that traffic to a public subnet one way to a NAT gateway, and that NAT gateway could go out and update the software one way. I don't even like to do that, James. <laughs> so uh, there's different things you can do to help that, but I believe it should never be connected to the internet. Any updates you need, you need to download those updates on your USB drive, scan that USB drive with a different couple of vulnerability scanners, then manually do that update. Now we're talking about kill switches and kill chains. Um, shout out to Gabe and uh, Alpha Cyber. This is more their world. But as far as application security, we got to talk when people do reconnaissance on your system, right? And if you ever put a system even on AWS, as soon as you put on internet, people start scanning, right? They do reconnaissance, right? Uh, they're trying to weaponize it. They try and deliver something to you, right? Either get you to click on some, either they're gonna try to upload it, either they're gonna try doing do a DNS poisoning, right? Exploration, installation, command and control, action and objective, right? So even though that's red team stuff when we looked on that, you need to understand that. As part of application security, because that's what they're trying to do to get to your box, right? So that should be one of your red boxes here, all right? You should have reconnaissance, scanning, um, and those type of attacks, right? If somebody delivers a payload and gets to your enterprise database, your DBA was slacking and clicked on something, right? Now you got that weapon on your server, right? What's your recall? What's your run button? Even though it's on the Linux part, can it get to the database or do you have it like in a sandbox where it can't do anything, right? But those are the things you need to run through. And Lockheed I guess published it. So that's where I took it from. So part of that chain is recon reconnaissance, research, identification, selection of a target, weaponization, pairing malware, containing exploits with deliverable payload. Adobe PDF, Microsoft Office files, deliver it, transmitting weapons, targets, email attachments, website, e or even USB drives. Ex exploitation, once delivered, the weapon code is triggered, exploiting vulnerable applications or systems. 
installation, the weapons may install a backdoor on the target system, allowing persistent access. All right. So once it gets on there, is it going to open up a back door? And now you got just people running in out your back system. Uh, command and control, malicious internal service communicate with the systems through a call back door, remote shell. It's a lot of times when you do ransomware, they put the command and control on a system, then it calls out to another website because sometimes those packages are big. And once they find a hole, they call that package over there to uh, install it, to exploit it. But the first time they put it on there, that's just to do the, the call out to the remote shell. Actions on objectives. Attackers work to reach the crown jewels and achieve the objectives of intrusion, exfiltration or destruction of data or disruption of service. All right. So that's where we talk about classification of your database. Where are your social security numbers? Where are your good stuff? Where is your intellectual property? If you Google, where is your Google search stuff? You can't see where you saving a recipe at, which, your, which database it is. Right. Each server doesn't get the same amount of attention because they don't have the same amount of value or high classification right so you got to classify your system so you know what to do let's see peter m so the intent is to expose to multiple attack points the cloud has less or more vulnerable points of an attack <laughs> i believe the cloud has more because usually internal right I'm locking it to just internal users, even if I'm opening it up to the internet, I'm, I've only have a certain point that I'm going to uh, make available on-prem. Um, the cloud has more vulnerable points, but they have better security, better systems, better patching, right? So I think that's the trade-off. The cool thing, though, is with AWS is most of the APO, APIs that they have open to the internet, you can actually, you can actually lock them down so they only have internal use inside your virtual private network, your VPC. So you can control all that. If you go back a couple of videos, we talked about that in Elastic Beanstalk, where we locked down Lambda, which is a API open to the internet. We said only our VPC could do it. Um, S3 Bucket, which people <laughs> leave open on the internet all the time. We Once again, we said only our network can talk to our VPC bucket, right? Anything coming from the internet, it has to be authenticated, right? Then we can say, okay, to get to this VPC bucket, it has to come from our internet and you have to have be MFA in it, right? So you can start locking down all those points. Uh, Peter, it's just hard and it's, it's a heavy lift. It's saying you do your database. Even though I have a DynamoDB that's open to the internet, I'm saying, oh no, only my internet, my VPC can only connect to my DynamoDB, right? But that's S configuration, routing rules, VPC endpoints, right? But you got to set all that. And we're going to do that coming up in the labs. How do you lock it down for a federal system and what does, and what does that look like? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's out of blocks. No, I see. Yeah, you can't ping. That's ping. Yeah, yeah. We ping is blocked out of the box, JM, 100%. Um, yeah, you definitely coming from the internet. You definitely. Um, I, the funny thing is I was doing a lab yesterday and I couldn't figure out if my router was <laughs> working. So I actually opened up to ICMP on my, uh, they call it security group, which was just a firewall, it's just an instant fire. So I opened up to ICMP so I could ping in front of the internet. Okay, okay. Oh, so it is getting some of my uh, load balancers working. It's something else I misconfigured. But now, nah, Jam, we're definitely blocking it. Once again, um, as a, a security engineer, I, I would open it up if somebody was debugging or something like that, but off the block box, yeah. We would block all that too. And the other thing too, uh, Jam, if you're on top of your game, most people when they get a um, when they ping or they scan, especially uh, script kitties, they scan in sequential order. So they're looking for this IP one, two, three, four, five. So if we see that on our scam um, scan, Jam, we're gonna take that that um, that uh, IP IP four address. We're gonna put that in our NAC, our NAC of firewalls, and we're gonna block that IP address. Why would we block it? If you're sequentially scanning my network, like we talked about, you're doing reconnaissance. I'm blocking your IP address for at least five days, right? I'm gonna put you in my firewall. They call it knuckles on uh, AWS. I'm putting you in my knuckle firewall, and I'm gonna block it. The cool thing is, we're gonna show that too. You can automate that. I'm gonna look through my VPC logs. If I see six, six uh, sequential scanning for that IP address, I'm blocking your IP. So 
is what happening in Hong Kong Police Department got a hack. Is what happening? The Hong Kong Police Department got hacked. I, mean, I think I did say that. Yeah, they they gonna get hacked because you got to think is <laughs> they're a nation surveilling state, so people are always trying to attack their police station, right? Because they're surveilling the nation, right? So yeah, they're definitely getting attacked. I appreciate that, Peter. I put that towards my my barbecue for today. <laughs> Shout out to the two fifty. But another uh program once again we we're on that aws i've been studying for my uh aws certs i got four so i'm hopefully the next two weeks i'm gonna sit for the um sysop aws certification shout out to jb he passed it uh go check him out he's doing some great things he's a network guy on aws so i like to see his perspective on aws because i come from a programmer's view he comes from a networking view so i like to see uh different views on aws so shout out to him but yeah so i'm studying for my uh, my sis op it's going pretty well so i'll probably sit for it in two weeks once again i got i got four of them so i'm trying to uh get ready to set up set for one of the professional ones in a couple ones i think i'm gonna set up set for the uh the architect uh professional hopefully in three months i'll sit for that so so Amazon Inspectors, a new automated vulnerability management service, scans AWS workloads for software vulnerabilities intended for network exposures with a few, few clicks in the management console and AWS organization. Amazon Inspector can be used across all accounts in your organization. Amazon Inspector automatically discovered running uh, Amazon EC2 instances, uh, container images, uh, Amazon Elastic Container Registry at any scale and immediately starts assessing vulnerability, right? So it gives you a few services, and I think, so that's what it looks like. You get the automatic loads, continuous scanning. You maintain your vulnerability database. We looked at what it would look like from the um, STIGs, right? We looked at how the report would look like. So this is going to give you additional information again, once again. We know what we need to fix, and two is, we can start figuring out what's the risk to our organization, right? What's what needs to be patched, what's not patched, right? The cool thing is, is services you can buy. They're not very expensive. And you can take those AWS inspector findings, guard duty, sys manager, and we can put them all in uh, AWS security hubs. And that would be one central spot for all our findings and all our security work we need to do, right? So that's the cool thing about that. And uh, so we're going to talk about the MITRE attack. I should have had my man, uh, uh, Struggle Security, come up. Gets more gay, baby, right? Advan advanced tactic techniques and common knowledge, right? Uh, MITRE is uh, publicly accessible based on foundation for development of specific threat models and threat methodologies, right? So there's a command. In oh, facts, facts. I use that at work a lot. This command. I use that at work a lot scan with random source address facts facts i use that at work quick story is i was working on a, a agency and their network security guy was me he said you can only see your stuff i ran an in matt jn and i had other agencies showing up i go well why can i see these three other agencies my man turned red he wasn't happy jm so i in map is my friend especially i'm a unix guy so i can actually script that up on unix um you can actually pipe that into a, a file and get that get that information so you can do different types of searches and stuff on it now facts facts so um uh but that's a good point too is you can do random searches for it so even if even if it's random if you if that ip is scanning my <clears throat> if that ip is scanning inside my vpc or my network infrastructure for more than two minutes jm boom i'm putting an ip address in there too but now you're right you're right there's different ways so but yeah but if that ip is scanning because if you scanning inside my vpc for more than two minutes and i didn't approve you and so people come to the security team and said okay we're doing this and we're gonna do this work and we're gonna be scanning cool right so we have tools and features looking for that stuff even if it's random jm if it's longer than two or three minutes yeah i'm putting that ip address in there if you were doing some real work, you're going to have to tell me to come and re release your IP address because I'm going to be blocking it at the NAC level, at, at the at, at the sub level. So you, you're going to be, I'll I'm be blocking it at the NAC level, right? So the two is I can block it coming in at the application load balancer. It, it, and if I'm at my office, right, and we're working on prem, 
I could pop, pump that to the um, Cisco guys. They could put that IP into the Cisco and tell Cisco to block it too, right? That's when you have your AWS and your own prem working together, right? So you can actually do that. So I can have my AWS NACL pass that on to my uh, Cisco guy, and they can actually put that IP in Cisco and, and block it from a uh, on prem level too, right? So MITRE. Framework provides comprehensive matrix of attacks and techniques used by attacker to compromise organization system with the same understanding of attackers uh, tactic and strategy used. Users can defend their system effectively. And that's what we're talking about, right? When we're talking about threat modeling, MITRE um, attack, right? Adversaries, tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. That's what you're using your threat model because they're showing you what the big nation states are using, right? That's where that comes from, right? So that's what you use to say, okay, can we prevent these attacks from a nation state, right? And then it tells you, um, consists of the 12 tactical ca categories, which is why of an attack is listed below. So that's it. I think I put the uh, link in the description. So I just want to touch on it, right? I might, I might need to get with a uh, struggle, uh, Gabe, and go over uh, um over that threat modeling because that's super popular right so what program can you use to actually um simulate that for you and this is the one once again i put this uh, link in the description box at the very bottom scroll to the bottom of it and it's uh it's called infection monkey it's a tool which spins up an effective virtual machine inside a random part of your cloud infrastructure inside means the firewall and what other perimeter defense you may have the machine itself is, in, is infested with all sorts of violent malware that will actively try to spread and infect everything around it. We make sure to infest the monkey VM with the latest and greatest viruses out without their destructive payload. Just like the original Netflix chaos monkey, the infection monkey runs with a predefined time limit. So what they did is they took the payload out. It's going to affect all your systems, but it's not going to affect them with a uh, with the payload to do ransomware it's just going to affect them to say oh i touched it and i was able to spread with it right so but two is we should have security groups knuckles blocking it we should have uh malware um virus protection right we should have a lot of things where if they release this we should be able to block it and quarantine it right so that's going to test your infrastructure at that certain level right we always make a copy of production. We never copy it in production. Right? So we take a copy, make a copy of production with pretty much the same software, just nothing in the database, and let it go and see what can it take over, what can, what can it affect, where can it go, what external endpoints can it touch, right? The cool thing is it was introduced, Netflix introduced it. It used to be called Semi Army. The idea was to have a bunch of automated process that check their cloud resiliency to various failure scenarios. The cool thing is Netflix created this. Shout out to Netflix. They put a ton of great things in open source in the community for people to use, right? The prime example was Chaos Monkey, which randomly shut down servers in their infrastructure to test the application ability to withstand server failure. When you know that a Chaos Monkey is running free in your infrastructure and your services stay up, you know that you can handle uh, server failure effectively. We think that a similar approach uh, applies to securing uh, cloud infrastructure. Right? So they were actually doing it more as a DDoS performance testing, but they added security stuff for it. Right? So, and that's it. Um, once again, I put a link in. It gives you a nice report. Um, so it says, why release it? Uh, infection monkey in the cloud. Security breaches happen all the time. They never happen exactly the way you expected, planned for, or defended against. Your infrastructure should be able to withstand a breach of the exterior security layer and handle the infection of external servers. Cloud security needs to be able to design for a perimeter breach, such as cloud apps need to be designed for server failure. The way to know that you are indeed ready and safe is to periodically release infection monkey inside your cloud and see what happens right so so that's one of the tools is so just uh showing you threat modeling application security at high level tools you need to um protect against 
and tools like Infection Monkey need that can validate what you set up, right? It's easy to say you secure, right? But when how you know you secure when you uh let that out in your <laughs> in your infrastructure, then you're gonna see how secure you are, right? Because you want to test it, right? And two is like I tell people, um, when you find it, it's really not a failure, right? It's an opportunity for you to get better, right? And, and that's what you see, and, that, and that's how you get there, right? I dropped the link if anybody want to come up. Do you need a sandbox environment to use an infection monkey? Um, I've seen people actually just create a copy inside uh, AWS and just uh, do it kind of like in their development environment. Because theoretically, if you look at it, it's not going to affect your environment. It's gonna like tag it and maybe shut down a server, but it's not gonna like let malware off or do ransomware off. The only thing I'm not familiar with is I need to double check is um, I've done performance testing and small security tech in AWS. I didn't have to let them know, but when you, I think Chaos Monkey is gonna start touching it, internal external points inside AWS. So I think you need to get permission or let them know when you're going to do it. Because I think if you let Chaos Monkey inside, they might shut down your whole VPC to protect all of AWS. So you, I think you will get need get need to get written per, uh, permission to uh, test out uh, Infection Monkey. I, I I put that on my list. I'm going to shoot them an email and see if I need to get written permission to, to test that. So once again, um, those are just a few of the highlights of that. Um, I can't remember if JM or, or Helmet asked me to do uh, application security. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Once again, that's Purple Team. Let me go up to my teams up in there. I think that was my teams. Got our wife in there for JM. So uh, AWS wife <laughs> for the uh, full version is three grand a month. So it's, it's a little pricey. So you got to be generating some money if you're going to do uh, AWS Wi-Fi. Last time I looked, it was three grand a month. So it was a little, it was a little pricey. So once again, application security, we're going to put that on the purple team. Um, like I said, touched on a gift, different things. So I think the big deal is in there. It's threat modeling. Um, how do you go through and, and test the old wife's top 10 and how you protect it in your app and how do you handle it? And what Chaos Monkey said, how you think you protect it and when an attack really happens, right? Two different things, right? So I think that's why we need to get that that infections monkey and get that out there. Like I said, that's I did that uh ooh, probably 10 years ago at DOD, we ran it. <laughs> so I haven't seen a new version. So um we've been running um Nexus scans and different type of scans for vulnerabilities. We didn't do a full, like I said, uh infectious type monkey scan so that's all i have i hope everybody has a great week i got to get back on these aws labs so i can get ready for my um, my sysop certification like i said I, I got about four of them so i'm trying to get a few more and then hopefully step my game up to get to the uh professional search trying to get a little of that aws bag out here once again if you need me professor black ops at gmail.com Reach out to me. Um, I'm an ex professor. You gotta give me 48 hours to respond. Don't don't jump the gun. <laughs> don't jump the gun. But that's all I got. Shout out to him. Everybody have a nice uh, week. Uh, get those certs. I, people are dropping a ton of Azure. I got a lot of respect for Azure, AWS, even all of them. Um, Google, Oracle's doing big work. There's just a ton of ton of ton of opportunities out there. Man, let's go get it. <laughs> Let's go get it, man. It's up there. Forget, it, man. Professor Black Ops. Have a great weekend. Um, thanks for support. Uh oh, job hunting. Job hunting, <laughs> etc. Yep, yep. I definitely get those search for those jobs. Like I said, uh, I'm on the bench right now, so my 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 company's trying to find me a new assignment. Oh, oh don't even mention Salesforce. I was on a second interview. They put on a hiring freeze on me. Helmet. They they shut down hiring and security. Uh, federal security. I was on my second interview. Uh, <laughs> Helmet, I thought I was going to get some of that Salesforce back. Uh, they hired, uh, I got a guy um, I'm cool with. He's a salesman for Salesforce. So I'm going to bring him on my channel. Um, he said they hired 30,000 people in the last three years. They said, we got to figure out if they're making us money or not. Because Salesforce went on a crazy hiring. I keep seeing jobs pop up. I don't know those are just really super needed. 
So I was going to reach out to my contact, but he told me uh, security definitely was putting a freeze on in a minute to let those all those hires that they hired shake out uh, just to see where they're at. And, you know, so, yep, shot, yep. Um, I had quite a few people reach out to me since I got my uh, AWS certif certifications. Uh, shout out to Kev Tech. Get those LinkedIn <laughs> profiles up there. Uh, textual Chatter, uh, Black Heights, all those guys are huge. Super, super huge on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm finally getting my LinkedIn game up. I'm, I'm kind of lazy, so I got it up. Like I said, I get some by every other day now since I got my AWS. Sir. Oh, facts, man. Salesforce, those salaries, because I'm in the Midwest. I'm in Indiana. I tell people uh, they got uh, two regional offices here. And like I said, I'm cool with one of the guys. He actually used to work for Oracle, and that's where I met him at. I, done, I did Oracle for 15 years. So then he went to Salesforce as a, as a salesman. Kind of like Black Heights, so uh, I'm gonna try to get back on that helmet, man. I hurt my feelings when he told me they they put they put the hiring freeze on there, man. I, I had one interview and it went super well. Um, once again, they're trying to get that uh, federal money. Um, once again, like we talked about, we were talking about Stigs, NIST, Fed Ramp type compliance in the cloud, and what does that look like? Because they're trying to get that uh, federal and state money. Once again, everybody have a, a great week. Let's get it. Uh, <sighs> Like I said, I probably take a little rest and get back on them lives and get back on that AWS.